Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. This is the last, I believe, in the series that uh, that we have been doing on all the steps that you need to write a song, arrange it properly so that you, you your song is going to work well, mix it, master it, everything that you need to know to get yourself there. Uh, then, once you're done, suddenly you've got this song. Your song's finished and you're like, what do I do? I see a lot of people ask online, what do I do? What's the best? This, that and the other. And you know what? Most of the advice they're given is, well, wrong. People might do it, but they're not winning with it. If your answer comes from somebody who is famous, you know, genuinely has made it in the industry, not just become a famous YouTuber, although that's of some value, but being a famous YouTuber is not the same as being, you know, Celine Dion or Cannibal Corpse uh, or Skid Row or, in this case, Yellow Man. Uh, making it is actually quite a different path from what most people tell you. So you're going to meet a slight dilemma in this video because there's going to be what everyone tells you to do and I'm actually going to say no because what you're trying to do will almost guaranteed fail because there's no sense behind your strategy. Most people sadly start with no strategy, which is part of what we will look at. So the first thing that we should do before this video truly becomes relevant for you, and I would be encouraging you to watch this early in the process, not going, oh, well, only watch that when I need, need it, because there's a lot that will help you prepare your material for this to be useful. But let's have a checklist. Well, the first thing is we need a great song. Just assuming your song's great because you've done it is, again, probably poor logic. You need a great song. It needs to have great performances. Now, one of the wonderful things is there are quite a lot of songs out there that are, we'll be a bit broad on saying that they're great. Uh, but if they've got great performances, they really happen. So make sure that you've got great performances. If you are relying on auto-tune or anything like that, I can pretty well guarantee your performances are not great. Now, before you go, but, 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 Think very carefully. If we look at classic songs that have stood the test of time, therefore we can prove that they are, that they are you know, really good and worthwhile, um, they are great performances. Then check to make sure, does the mix of this set the scene and tell the story of that song? If your song doesn't have a, have a story, it's not a good song. It just can't be. Make sure the mix is setting the scene. It's like telling people, this is where this is happening. This is how this, this song is about. You know, what, what, what's the environment that we're wanting people to feel that they're in here? How do we want them to feel? Uh, and then, of course, making sure that you tell the story. Um, that's in the words of the song. It's in the performance of the song, but it's also in how we mix it. If we, um, if we have a club banger and we've mixed our drums quieter, than everything, then we've probably got it wrong. If we've got a, uh, a ballad about somebody and the drums are so loud and the vocals are down here underneath everything else, we've got it wrong because we're not honouring the story. And then at the end of that, once we've got a, a great song with great performances and a great mix that helps set the scene and tell the story, then we master that up. There's that last video that I did on mastering, not what a lot of people will tell you and not what a lot of people expect. You want your stereo 1644 master. People tell you need other things, whatever, if it amuses you, but stereo 1644, what you could press to a CD, that is what you want. Now it's release time. Yay! This is where we have to have a strategy, and the earlier we are aware of our strategy, the better. Remember I said watch this early because it can help influence what you write. If your band happens to be called Cannibal Corpse, and you're thinking, we might sing that My Heart Will Go On song, you may well be going counter to your strategy. So understand what your strategy is. Who are we chasing? Who am I chasing? Who am I looking to be the leader of? Because all too often, people work under that, if you build it, they will come. Now, it made for a cool movie with baseballers and fields of corn and what have you, field dreams. 
But as a market research point and strategy, it is, well, it's planning to fail. So I don't think that the if you build it, they will come happens. It's easy to look at, and this is where a lot of people go wrong, they look at an after the fact and then create a story for what happened. Or oh, Pink Floyd, you know, they were everywhere on the radio. Therefore, if I'm everywhere on the radio, then I'll become Pink Floyd. Let's stop and think on that for a moment. Pink Floyd were everywhere on the radio once they'd released a record that lots of people liked listening to. Until that point, Pink Floyd were not on the radio that much. They were this weird band that made weird noises with weird backdrops. And um, they played in funny polytechnics and what have you. They built their fan base slowly over a lot of years and a lot of pretty strange records until they reached that point where they're suddenly all over the radio. And they were suddenly all over the radio because they made a record that was so amazing that everyone wanted to hear it all the time. Dark Side of the Moon, if you're wondering what that is. So you've got to have a strategy. So that's a case of being prepared. So here are some of the things that you've really got to do. And remember, underneath these, we've always got to be thinking, what is our strategy? Just saying, oh, I've ticked that box doesn't mean that we've actually done anything of any value at all. First thing, if we're going to publish our song or our album, and I'm a big fan of albums because song, loose songs are... People go, oh, but, but nobody buys albums anymore. It's like, well, yeah, if they're Trailer Swift fans who only listen to Spotify, that's fine, but they're never going to be your target market. If you think that's your target market, you have just shot yourself in the foot right from the word go. You might build yourself up to becoming an equal of Trailer Swift or... Um, um, cold plate or um, or nickelback or whatever great good on you have have that as your goal but you've got to work your way there so cover art you've got to make sure you've got good cover art remember as i said before your job is to lead not to lead everybody michael jackson thriller was the biggest record in like forever and yet if you were able to go out there and find how many people owned Thriller, let alone any Michael Jackson record, you would find that it was a surprisingly small percentage of the population. You're not looking for everybody. You're looking for the people who want to be your fan, which is why we do have genres and subgenres. Not to obsess over, that, uh, that, that really gets my goat, but are you chasing people who are more likely to want to buy a Cannibal Corpse record or are you chasing people who are more likely to want to buy a Celine Dion record? Or are you chasing people who are more likely to want to buy a Yellow Man record? Who are your target market? Initially, it's hard to know who they are, in which case you've still just got to be a leader. You've got to say, well, who do I think is going to listen to me? If you don't know who your fans are, that is fine. Chances are the people who want to listen to you should be you. If you look at your record collection and go, okay, I've got these records, I'm making stuff that's kind of similar to that, then you are your target market. Brilliant. Work out what made you buy each of those records and do that. If you look at all of your records and you go, gee, they're all 70s rock, and yet I'm trying to write, you know, 2025 EDM, you've got to ask yourself the question, am I really on par? If you've got fans, great, we don't need to be having this conversation, but if you don't, chances are you have no strategy for what you're doing or your strategy is, oh, I'll just try to be everything to everybody. Big fail. So cover art. A really good example of recent cover art is the, um, the cover for the new Skid Row record, The Gang's All Here. Look at it, we can't see a single face. All we see is these long head gits with very, very tight jeans. But that is a cool record cover. That really is. That record cover says a lot. Whoever staged it, took the photo, hire them. They know what they're doing. They've told us, yeah, and to some extent that these guys are older, but they've also told us that they are rockers. They almost look rockabilly in this situation, especially the guy with the really skinny legs. That leads us somewhere. That sort of says, if you feel what this cover is saying follow me. And I did. I have never been a fan of Skid Row. I followed in, listened to that whole record yesterday and I enjoyed it. It is a good record. At no stage through that whole record, I don't know how long it is, did I ever feel like, oh, I'm going to abandon this or turn it off or whatever. I'm thinking, 
I like this record, I could make that part of my life. They have led me to where they want me to be, where I want to be, which is Skid Row record, cool. I'm having fun. The other side is this Yellow Man cover. Now, I knew nothing about this guy. It just came up because I looked for bad record covers to try to give a sense of you don't want to do this kind of stuff. We're looking at the Yellow Man cover, and without any context, and this is important, without any context, that is well and truly one of the worst record covers ever. There are some other ones which are dubious. Man standing behind a cow. Uh, but this one really is... Well, it's pretty cake-taking. There, there is not a lot nice about this. It's a horrible shot of a weird-looking guy walking jewellery store. Everything about it is just like, ugh. You don't want to do this. I see a lot of really terrible cover artwork. But what they did do right was that they wrote Yellow Man on the front, and they did have a picture of the guy. Now, it turns out that this guy is not actually a loser. He is a Jamaican. He's actually a black guy but he's an albino black guy, <laughs> so he looks funny. And Yellow Man comes from the, uh, the, the, the taunts from when he was a, a kid. He's actually one of the most successful uh, Jamaican toasters uh, and a major proponent of dancehall, early dancehall. I went, tracked down his first big record, which thankfully had a better cover than this, uh, sat down, had listened to the whole thing, and it's like, wow, this is just so super. Suddenly, past the duchy on the left-hand side, made a lot of sense, as did things from other songs that I grew up with. I'm pretty confident that David Bowie had been listening to that record, uh, particularly when it came time to his song Modern Love. So once we put context in, his cover, well, it doesn't become good, but at least it improves. If you don't understand or don't display the context, see the Skid Row record cover, that displays context. It's urban. We can see that they're older. These are not 17, 18 year old boys anymore, but they've given the context, well, it's American. We've got their, their, their flags draped across their back, which says rock and roll and, and, you know, appeals to, well, lots of kinds of people. It's really rather cool. It's, it's, as I say, it's got this rockabilly or even punk type feel to it. So it's telling us that these guys are older, but they are going back to their roots. And it leads well. Doesn't matter whether you like the record or the band or not, it leads well. So this is what we want to do. They also say to us, the gang's all here. The band hasn't been together for some time, is my understanding. And this is the band. Cool. Winning. So you need a good record cover art. Do not cut corners. Do not be one of those people that just posts a, a, a random shaped photo with no picture of the artist, no album name, no song name, no nothing. That's just done. Equally, we need to have band, avatar, posters, things like that, because we are going to need to place them in the places where we are making our place. And if we don't define that, if we don't hang our pictures on the wall, we can't say this is our place. We are not branding ourselves. It's important to brand yourself. Skid Row there, that record contains a lot of branding, even though you might say, well, there's no logo. Nah, but it's branded. It's got a strong sense of something. Yellow Man, if you know who Yellow Man is, that branding may have actually been okay. If you don't, not cool at all. You are going to need a video. If you say, oh, but, 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 whatever pathetic excuse you have for not making a video, sorry, I'm going to be blunt. You're just not ready to do this. Everyone can make a video. You can at least take your album cover, put it on the screen, and play your music underneath it. Done. If anybody's interested in your music, they're going to sit with it. If they're not, who cares? You're not here chasing Michael Jackson fans if you're Skid Row. You're chasing Skid Row fans. You're chasing people like me who are open to becoming a Skid Row fan. That's all you absolutely need to do. If you want to do other stuff and personalise and put yourself in it, if you've got a phone with a camera, brilliant, you're set, go to it. Because video editors are a dime a dozen. Do some amusing stuff, whack your song underneath it, render it off, make sure that your song sounds good, You've got a video. There must be a video. Make a thumbnail for it. So when you go and look through YouTube lists of videos, you have a thumbnail. Now, if you don't make one of those, that can be okay if YouTube happens to offer you a good shot. But it's far better to have 
the album cover and explanation of what it is. So if your album cover doesn't clearly denote, well, this is a goth record, then you might want to have your album cover and then write goth next to it. You've got to help lead people. You also need copy. Copy being text. Now I'm going to bring up an example here of some very unfortunate copy. This is a, a band, I know that English is their second language, but it's no excuse. Their first debut album. Oh, how many debut albums are they planning to have? They're going to have 47 first albums? It's just tautological and therefore looks stupid. And before you go, oh, but, but you're just being pedantic and no one cares. No, they've made themselves look silly already. They've reduced their credibility. Anybody who understands rock knows that the term is their debut album. These guys instinctively know this as well. But then they made deals of themselves by saying, here's our first number one, the first record debut first, first, first that we're firstly doing. Doesn't come across real well at all, does it? It's like when I went to see Severed Heads and Tom Ellard walked out on stage and said hello with the Beatles. I just thought, what a spank. Don't do these things. Make sure your copy is good. 14X22, WTF. Don't make me ask what the hell that's about. I assume that they're trying to give us a date that it's going to come out on the 14th of the 10th month, October, in 2022. Well, it's past that date, so you bloody well should fix that out now. And then what we're going to talk about in some depth later, soon on all major streaming services. So you posted this thing with nowhere for people to go. What if I really liked that record? Let's say I encountered that two days after it was published. I really liked that record and said, I want to go buy that off your band camp or wherever I can buy this, assuming they're smart enough to have such a thing. Streaming services would indicate perhaps not, in which case I couldn't buy it at all, which is a big F you to building fans. Soon all major streaming services, that means I've got nowhere to go. So they're hoping that by 14X 2022, I'm going to actually remember them and their record that I will have diarised it to go tracking around to try to find it. Uh, this is really, really poor copy. They haven't thought about what they're doing or how to build a relationship and how to let me take the next step. This whole let's build a, a hype around it, yeah, great, but not that way. The other common one is the... Um, uh, let's say it's a new Mark Knopfler record, and he would not do this, I'm sure, is to have a whole pile of copy about Mark this, Mark that. Mark joined a band when Mark this, Mark that. Hang on. You're Mark yourself, aren't you? I can tell you are because it says at the top of your Facebook and YouTube that you're Mark Knopfler. You want to engage with me and get me closer to you in terms of a relationship, making me want to hand you cash, then I was born here, I done this, I done that, I, 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 I. If you think that I makes you small, then you need to go sit with a therapist so that you don't feel small about yourself. Don't go writing third person. Because if Benedict starts talking about Benedict in third person, it's actually a sign that Benedict is insane. I do it as a joke. But don't make your copy that way. Then, of course, we've got to have actual product, and you need to think very carefully at what you do. I see a lot of acts going straight into creating physical product. If you have a following, if you've got physical people who are chasing you around, tugging at the back of your t-shirt, going, can I get your CD, sir? Can I get your vinyls, sir? Never call them vinyls. It's an album, it's a record. Oh, it's on vinyl, but vinyl just says loser. Press at that point, but before that point, do not press. Otherwise, it's just ego, it's vanity. You will have wasted 500, 3,000, whatever the price is going to be, you'll have wasted that money on something that sits in the corner and makes you feel embarrassed. Don't do it. Chances are, if you're watching this, you're good to go for a digital release, which means you're going to put it up on the internet and encourage people to find it there. The question then is, well, where do I put my song, my record, my album, what have you? The very simple answer is surprisingly, well, simple, wherever your fans are. Now, I mentioned Celine and Cannibal Corpse, who are my common sort of, you know, let's put thing, two things that don't belong together together. 
If Celine releases a new record, is it wise for her to drop into um, we are the death metaliest of death metaler groups on Face Space and Instaham? No. Because does she have a welcoming audience? No. Let's say even that there was a guest where Cannibal Corpse said, let's get Celine in. And Celine says, yeah, this is going to be a laugh. You know, I will always stab you or something like that. Then it's still going to be better for Cannibal Corpse to drop into the death metaliest of death metal groups to say, hey, look, we've done this with Celine. So they can try posting it in her sort of fan base, but they may not dig it. But this is the thing. We've got to have a sense of strategy. Who are we talking to? If we're talking at cross purposes or to people who are not potential fans, we are at fault. It's on us. Now, the idea that everyone from 8 to 80 is going to be our fan is marketing stuff up, number one. It's just absolute fail. I see so many people do it. They think, oh, well, if I just put it out everywhere, then everyone will, will know that it's there and everyone will love it. Okay, remember how many people bought Michael Jackson records? Not just Thriller, but Michael Jackson records. It was actually not a very big percentage of the population. I remember seeing a statistic given, and it seemed credible at the time. I don't remember what it was, but it was like, oh, only that. But he was still the king of pop and one of the biggest grossing guys in the game. So wherever your fans are, have a strategy. If you don't know who your fans are, that's okay. Again, remember... Look at your record collection and what you're doing matches. Go there. So if I'm presenting some of my own personal music, uh, which I refer to as space music, then I can realistically look through my collection and go, well, I've got a lot of Tangerine Dream. So I'll find people who are listening to Berlin School and I'll post around them. And you know what? I get a little bit of interaction from them. Because I don't sound like Tangerine Dream. So many of them are trying to clone Tangerine Dream records, which is yeah, good on them, I guess. Occasionally there's one that's sort of worth listening to, but largely they're too sort of... <laughs> there's, there's nothing special about the records. But at least I get some recognition there. I get a few new fans from there, largely those who are like me, open to a lot of things, and they're not there looking for clones of. They're just like, well, this is as close as I can get. So f go where your fans or potential fans are and listen to feedback that you get. My advice very strongly, and we're gonna talk more about this later, is probably Bandcamp. You start uploading to Bandcamp before you do anything else. You take your Stereo Master at 1644 and you up onto Bandcamp, along with your cover art, your, um, your, your band image, your avatar of who and what you are, preferably your shining mug, because if you hide who you are, there's a lot of difficulty in selling nobody. People buy people. See how I created a relationship with Yellow Man, had no idea who he was, found this interesting record cover, did some research before I made a total doofus of myself, and it's like, oh, Yellow Man. Now I know some about Yellow Man, and I have a relationship with Yellow Man because he's a person. He's not some kind of stick figure who's not real at all. So make sure that you brand your band camp as you go and then pop up your video. Your video should be finished before you pop your stuff on band camp. Don't say, oh, we'll put out our song now and then somewhere in the next 43 years we might get around to making our video. Because when you don't make your video, guess what? You look like a dill. If you deliberately decide I'm going to hold it a week so that I get a second opportunity to post, here's my song, here's my video, fair, fine call, because you say my video will be ready in a week and 6.59, bing, video. You do that. You've kept your promise to your fans. That's okay. So Bandcamp and YouTube, because YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, both owned by Google as a matter of interest. Uh, and people who are looking for music, it's the largest search engine. Saying, oh, well, I'll go to Spotify so people can search for me. Like, why are they searching for you there? Chances are they aren't, or if they are, it's because they've heard of you. I can go to Spotify and type in Judas Priest, because guess what? I know who Judas Priest are. 
I could go there now and type in Yellow Man, but I found it on Bandcamp. Thank you very much. Uh, so Bandcamp, YouTube is your feeder. And then you really ideally want to have your own site. Either way, you need a part of the internet that you own and you control. If you don't own it, you don't control it. You're at the whim of whoever and whatever does what. Elon Musk decides to reinvent the internet. You're done for. Have something that's yours and that you own. Everyone's going to tell you to go into streaming. I'm going to tell you don't. We will talk about that more in a little bit. There are some serious downsides to streaming and no real upsides. Again, that idea of the if you build it, they will come. I'll just throw it out and everyone will bow to my magnificence. Maybe you are right typing your name in third person because you're insane. There's no good logic to this. Uh, you've got to build your fans one by one. So how do we build fans? What does actually work? Now, before we get into answering that question, we've got to qualify what works and have reasonable targets. If we look at, quick history lesson, um, Rome trying to defeat Northern Europe, the Gauls, so that's France and, and the Germans, how long did it take? I think it was 100 or so years. They never really managed to fully own them. So the idea of conquering territory, pulling people into you and thinking that you can do it instantly is insane. So building fans, it takes time and you really need to be thinking in terms of ones. Yellow Man scored one new fan yesterday. That's great. Because you know what? Before that, he didn't have at least me as a fan. Now, Yellow Man personally probably doesn't care that much. He doesn't even know unless he just happens to luck into watching this video. Dude. Uh, but the thing is, when you are tiny, you've got to think in ones. So the, the Roman Caesar, this, that and the other, we came, we saw, we, uh, we ate their snails. Uh, he didn't go, oh, I'm going to go straight from here to the English Channel because he knew that he would get wiped off the face of the map. He worked bit by bit by bit by bit. And for you with building fans, you're largely building them one at a time. Really hyper important. People think, oh, well, if I build fans, then I've got everything. Massive problem. We need four pillars to build success. This is a good number because guess how many legs your table has? Four. You need four legs. Without that, it's gonna be wobbly. If you've had one of those tables that's just got this single round base, you get rid of it soon enough because it's horrible. You need four pillars. So the first one, the most important one, more than anything else, is artist development. You need to be someone. As I said before, you need to be a leader. You need to lead your people, your tribe. When I saw Skid Row, I resonated with at least some of what they were saying. Some was like, mm, Skid Row, I don't think I'm really into Skid Row. But then I see, you know what, I have, I do know that Sebastian's a hard worker. Uh, that's their singer. And you know what, they're older guys. And there's this kind of, we're rockers, there's rockabilly, there's, there's even a slight punk feel in here. That resonated with me. That was enough for me to try this record. And the gang's all here. That's, that resonated nicely. They led me. So you need to develop who you are as an artist. Now, Yellow Man's covers may have been almost universally disturbingly bad, but he developed a very strong sense of who and what Yellow Man was. Go have a listen to a few of his records. It seems to run through all of them. I'm not an expert on him by a long shot, but he did have a strong, solid career. And while a lot of that was based in Jamaica, his identity was quite strong and quite clear. He used his weakness because in, um, in his culture, being white was actually, a, you know, it, it was a, a revile thing. You know, he was like, there's something wrong with you. Um, albinos were commonly pushed out of African type cultures. It's not a judgy, simply a fact. Plus he was a, 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 an orphan, so he had very little going for him. Uh, but he managed to harness that and use it, and it became his thing. His tag is Yellow Man. So he owned the thing that he could control. 
So there are plenty of people like that. C6 Steve uses that. There was, um, oh, I've forgotten his name. There was a comedian in Australia who had palsy, which means he shook all the time. And he used that as part of his act. He would laugh at that. And that was cool. That was good. That gave him power. So find who you are, how you can be a leader. And that does not mean saying, oh, well, I like Trailer Swift, so I'm going to buy the same jacket as Trailer Swift and get the same haircut and everyone will love me. Everyone will look at you and go, what a sad loser, because you're not anybody. You're following somebody else in the hope that uh, some of their shine rubs off on you. So you need artist development. Artist development is very hard to do on your own unless you just so happen to be one of those kinds of people. But even a lot of those kinds of people who've come out to have amazing, tremendous presences, Adamant, Kiss, um, Spice Girls, um, and I bet there were people behind Yellow Man who were helping him, they have all worked with others to help build a product, a definable product. You need to do that. The best person to do that with is a record producer, not a beat maker, but a record producer, one who specializes in artist development. I know a lot about this because that's what I do. Number two, you need a backline. If you read up on Yellow Man, then you will find that they talk about, well, you know, he made this record with these guys. He made this record with these guys. He made this record with these guys. They're his backline. They're the people who are helping make his stuff happen. So Yellow Man's not just this funny looking guy. Yellow Man's actually a whole group of people. Sometimes, like in a, 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 a band that never changes its lineup, let's say Iron Maiden or uh, George Strait's Ace and the Whole Band, I don't think they've ever changed their lineup, then that's, that's clearly definable. But often they're behind the scenes. Trailer Swift would have tons of people behind the scenes delivering the Trailer Swift experience. You need those. Without those people, you will go nowhere. And it's easy to say, oh, well, those people will arrive when I've got success. No, they won't. You'll have scavengers arrive once you've got success. Some of them can be good scavengers. You know, Sony Music comes along and says, you know, George Michael, I, we've noticed you're doing okay for yourself. Would you like to move off their little label to our top label? Yes, sir, that'll be like $30 billion. Thank you very much. That's just, that's good scavenger. But mostly you'll just get bad scavengers. See them all over the internet, you know, people trying to engage people in conversation when they're, they're clearly just looking for the scam. You need to develop really strong working relationships. It might take a little bit of time to find those working relationships, but look at the backstory of almost any truly successful band. Seeing we're talking Skid Row, I don't know much about them, but I know a bit more about Motley Crue. Uh, and they had to shuffle around. Mick Mars had to shuffle various things until he could get the right collection of people on what became the Motley Crue bus and then Motley Crue as we know them now. Vince may be a worry now, but in his day, Vince was pretty special. The example that I commonly give there is that there are quite a collection of wonderful photos of Giorgio Moroder and Donna Summer. Now, these were a pair of B-listers, shall we say, in the music industry. People who were doing things that were interesting and very cool, but they hadn't, they hadn't, you know, reached Trailer Swift standards of, of success. And they worked together. Exactly how they got set up, not rightly sure, doesn't rightly matter. But there are lots of photos of them after that where these two B-listers made each other A-listers. They were backline for each other, particularly Moroder for Summer, because he did what made her amazing song, I Feel Love. And so many people are still stealing that. Baseline. I mean, he could have made a million off the number of people who stole his baseline. He may have stolen it himself. These are the kinds of relationships that you want to build. Now, you have to be a good partner to attract good partners. Another great example is the Elton John, Bernie Taupin thing, A Lifetime, or watch Jersey Boys, uh, the, the fellow that they bring in, uh, who initially they think is too goofy, but without him, the band wouldn't have had the success. Frankie Valley wouldn't be Frankie Valley. The Four Seasons wouldn't be remembered now. Barry Gordy, it was really super important to that. He was, in a sense, their backline, even though he became part of the band. But you see there are other people who are backline for them, including the mobster. You've got to have 
backlight. Not necessarily mobsters, because they're not always cool as Christopher Walken. I know, because I've known some. Uh, some of them are cool, but generally be careful with that one. It's not a piece of advice, but you need backline. You need people behind you who are part of your crew, part of your team, who help you to do your things. Then you need location. You need to play live, if at all possible. If you're not prepared to play live, you probably should give up because it's going to be really, really hard to build an audience, especially seeing online people are far more drop and run away. I'm uh, more of, uh, of a local group for local bands and what have you, and 99.99999% of posts are dumped there, as in the advertiser possibly isn't, doesn't even come into the group. They just share them in, possibly using some piece of third-party software that just posts out their garbage adverts. And there's no engagement. Somebody pops into the group saying, oh, I'm looking for a venue for my band. None of the venues say, here, let's have a listen. It's all just dump. So assuming that the internet's going to go two ways is flawed thinking at the moment. You need a location. Now, your physical location, great. Can I go out the door? Is there, are there venues within my striking distance where I can drive to, where I can pick up my, my instrument and get in a bus to? Great. Work on that. Work on working out how to get in there. Don't say, oh, but it's too hard. Work out how to do it. If you want to pitch your own stuff, you might need to join somebody else's band first. You know, the dropkick deadbeats who play at so-and-so's dive bar. Maybe being then for six months will, will open some other opportunities. So then when you go on stage with your own stuff, the super excellent dude, then, oh, he's from the, the, the dropkick deadbeats. You know, you, you've got to build, you've got to take some time here, but you've got to have a location, you've got to draw people to you. The whole idea of just saying, I'll throw it on the internet and everyone will find me, and my awesomeness will just shine so much. Yeah, remember, that's like talking in third person. Benedict's talking about Benedict because Benedict's crazy. It's, there's no logic in that thinking. You've also got your online local. Now, my online local, obviously, very simplistically, I've got that. As I said, I'm a moderator in a local group, local musicians. Yeah. But there are things that are probably better. Remember I spoke about Berlin School Group. I'm in a Berlin School Group, so people who like Tangerine Dream and music like that. So I post my new record there. If I feel like it's got any connection to Tangerine Dream and Berlin School and that kind of feel, then I'll post it there. And I get a couple of likes, maybe a comment or two, uh, and I see my Bandcamp stats spike. And I have seen people buy, and I've even had a couple of people say, yeah, I bought your record. It's taken me a long time to build a fan base, and my fan base is very small. So no illusions, no delusions about this. But it has grown, and the more consistent I've been about what I do, the better it's grown. The less I've tried to do the splattergun approach, the more my fans have grown. Go figure. You need a location, you've got to draw people to you. You hear about Skid Row, you hear about Pink Floyd, you hear about the girl that twerks and played the, the, the crystal flute. You go out of your way to find them. You go to YouTube, you type in their name, you're going to their location, you are following them. You need people to be doing that with you. Now, of course, before you're a known name, no one's typing your name in, but that's where you just hope to interrupt with things like YouTube. So if you're goth, then you go into goth groups and you don't make a deal of yourself. You simply talk to other people, people in other bands and this, that and the other. And sooner or later, someone's going to click on your signature and go, oh, you've got a goth record of your own. Or you can simply say, hey, I've been around for a while now. Don't know whether you know, I'm in a goth band. Here's my goth record. And maybe a couple of people engage. If they like you and you create a positive relationship, you'll get, at least get a pile of likes and maybe a few positive comments. And if you're lucky, you'll actually get someone buy your record. Don't be afraid to ask, but don't go pushing. Do not go saying, I'll like your record if you like my record. That's just scamming. And YouTube and what have you know all about these scams. Don't do it. Plus, it looks terrible. Um, as in, With my record producer hat, with my mix engineer hat on, somebody sends me something and they say, look how many plays we've got. Right, I see. I see sort of what looks like probably two genuine interactions and the other 10,000 that you've told me are genuine were clearly scammers or spam. 
you know, you bought this spam, therefore you're a scammer, therefore I will not touch you. And it's not a personal thing, it's like everybody in the business knows about this, don't do it. If you want to know the ultimate poster child for that, look at Jared Threatin, Threatin, T-H-R-E-A-T-I-N. He is the poster child of scammy losers um, who destroyed his own career before he could even get it off the ground by being too clever for himself. He tried to play the fantasy of what people like to think the internet is. So you've got to build your fans one by one and not engage in spammy, scammy kind of stuff. Talk to people, engage, create relationships. If you don't want to create relationships, no one's going to want to create a relationship with you. Now, you're not always going to be talking with your fans. My most loyal fans, I actually have no idea who they are. I could tell you their names, two or three names, but I'm not going to. Um, you could probably work it out if you were bored enough to, to check it out. Um, I know their names, but I don't know anything about them. I've tried to talk to one or two of them twice, and I've never got a response. They don't actually want to personally engage with me, but they do want to personally engage with my music. I know this because every time I put a record out on Bandcamp, within about three days, the regular contenders have purchased. That's another sale. Thank you very much, Bandcamp. It takes time. So your four pillars, you must develop an identity as an artist, which is you and unique to you. There can be similarities. As looking at that Skid Row record, yeah, there's some similarities with um, Stray Cats at this point in time. But it's still, it's not a Stray Cats record. You've got to have a backline. If you don't have a backline, you'll just fall over. You'll never go anywhere. Don't think that you can hire or develop a backline after you've become famous. Don't go, oh, well, I can't afford it. Opportunity cost. What's the cost of not doing this thing? I've seen a lot of acts who I could help to greater success. I never promise where anybody's going to go, but they didn't want to either spend money or all too often they didn't want to spend any time or go through the slightest bit of discomfort in changing anything about themselves or being seen in public. Look at Yellow Man. He's not Brad Pitt, is he? It'd be very easy for a fellow like that to say, I don't want to be seen in public. And maybe that's part of why he made that record cover as a bit of a, to all of those people who wanted to garbage him for not looking like Brad Pitt or whoever's cool in Jamaica in 1983. Maybe that was why he made that record cover to say, bugger you, I'm actually, well, yellow man and people are following what I do. You know, I'm influencing rock and roll in Britain. How cool is that? Yellow man somebody. So get your backline, your development of who you are, and then build your fans one by one by leading them somewhere special. When I listen to Dark Side of the Moon, it might be like 300 years old, but you know what? It's still a very special record. Every time I say Pink Floyd, there's a reference on that because of how damn good they are. Build your fans. Now, as I promised uh, a few times, we are going to talk about streaming and we'll encapsulate the word streaming with Spotify. They have sort of owned that space, and I think that the streaming thing is an incredibly bad plan. I've made a whole video on this before, so I pulled over the, uh, the image that I made with that, which will be up here. The problem with distribution is that it is A, lazy, and therefore you think, well, that's great, I can get to the whole world instantly with little to no effort and possibly even little to no cost. Again, let's think opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of this? If we put this up against the, um, the four pillars of success, how does distro, the distro disc services that send you off to Spotify uh, and YouBoob and everywhere else, how does that rack up for you? Do you gain more than you lose? Well, in my estimation, you lose far more than you gain. I have tried it. I've got a couple of things out there and they have seriously underperformed. And um, one of those records uh, kept being pulled down. I had to send a very, very nasty message to, uh, to the distro that was used for that to tell them in no uncertain terms to stay the F away from my video because they kept pulling it down because in their estimation, they owned it. No effing way, you distroed it, and it's my video of my music, 
and you don't have the right to interfere with it. Fair enough if you flagged it in the first case. You said, oh, gee, our, our bot has flagged this. But no, they just kept flagging it and pulling it down. And then they had the gall to tell me that I was doing it wrong. So, um, yeah, no. The distro services is beyond just that experience. Uh, the distro services do not do you any favours. They are there to get your content for free. If you want to make a living of being a musician, what's the first thing you need to do? Well, make money. Spotify will not give you any money. I, I'm owed a certain amount of money by them and a few other similar sorts of you put your content here. And have I ever made a red cent off any of them? No, they've held it. They've made up various bogus rules and, and what have you as to why they're not going to pay me my rightfully earned income. Bandcamp, when I make a sale, no matter how small it is, within about three days, well, they've sent me an email straight away, but the money's in my PayPal. Yeah, I lose a little bit, but you know what? It's better to have that than nothing. Promises. Oh, yes, we promise we'll pay you this sometime. Yeah, the 12th of never actually never comes up. That's why it's such a clever song lyric. Thank you, Cliffy Bastard. Don't do this. They are interested in serving themselves. Fair enough, they're a business, but their role here is only to get your content for free and to give you nothing in return. If a fan happens to find you, and it happens, this is like roll the dice, um, win a million dollars kind of odds. If they happen to find you through the clutter of Trailer Swift and Coldplate and Nickelback, then guess what? They can't do anything. They can maybe play your song, but then the next song will probably be Trailer Swift again. I pick on you, Taylor, but... You're just useful in this situation. I, I, I don't dig what you do, but I admire your success. So there's no disrespect here intended. The thing is, if somebody plays your song and likes it, they can't click on a link to go to your band camp and, and engage with you. They can't buy your song. The money that you've made, you'll never see. Or it'll be such a pittance that you'll laugh at yourself for having the work that you did to get there. Everything about their system is wrong. You will build no success there. Yes, it can work if you're already successful. Yes, people can go to Spotify and type in Trailer Swift or Judas Priest or whatever, or Sisters of Mercy, because they're there looking for those things, or Yellow Man. But you know what? It's not a good thing. If I would found Yellow Man yesterday like I did and gone, oh, okay, this is legit, and gone to Spotify rather than to Bandcamp, then I would have not been presented with the opportunity to actually buy some of his records. Whereas by going to Bandcamp and finding him, I couldn't find all his records, I couldn't find that one. Uh, but definitely his first record, that's on my, yeah, I'm going to get that record. And I know I can get that record because I've been there with the Buy Now button. I think it was eight bucks or something or other. It's It's... It's an important piece of musical history and I think I should own it, even though I'm not massively into that kind of sound. It's like, that is cool, you know? Uh, so the distro thing and Spotify, it actually undoes Pillar 3. Remember Pillar 3 is location. It strips all sense of location and all sense of ability to lead. As in you can't develop who you are as an artist properly. You've got no back line because they've severed that relationship. You've got absolutely no location because they sever any sense of location. The only location that exists in the world to Spotify is Spotify. And they will move people around inside Spotify, but never let them out. This is a bad, bad call. And yes, you can get plays, but you can't turn those plays into anything. Those plays, you can't... You know, it's not like poker chips where you can, you can walk to the front of the casino and say, I'd like to exchange these poker chips for cocaine and hookers, please. And they go, yes, sir, coming right up. You take your plays out of the, 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 the arena, they are simply evaporate in your hand. They're worth nothing. You get nothing for it. Also, people think, oh, well, it's great because the distro disservice will actually make my YouTube video for me. <sighs> no, they will not. They will make a thing that looks like a video, but is not a video. It's unsearchable, unless you were specifically searching for that very thing. Now, remember, that's okay. That works for Judas Priest, because people are typing in Judas Priest. 
but you see that there are legit videos from Judas Priest. They don't rely on their distro disk service to do that stuff for them. They probably tell them, don't. If I am looking at, uh, let's say I'm looking at Judas Priest, I'm looking at a Priest record and I'm going, yeah. and I'm open at the same time to another band that might be, you know, kind of similar to Priest. And I look down the side and they, and they offer me some band. Let's say, for example, um, 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 Demon, legit band. I have one of their records, great record. Uh, taking the world by storm. Let's say they offer me that. That's a legitimate real video. Those videos down the side, the suggestions, they are never the ones that are sent over by the distro disk service. Therefore, you can never be found. So if Demon had never made a video of their own, had never uploaded it, or none of their fans had ever done that, but they just relied on the distro disk service to make it easy for them, then I would never have a Demon record. I would never have clicked on something and gone, you know, that's a bit interesting. And then come back sometime later and go, and I remember that, that was a bit interesting. Looked up something else and then hit taking the world by storm and go, how awesome is this? These are the relationships we need to build. Your distro, disk services, Spotify, etc. While promising to put you all over the world, will technically deliver, but then will undo absolutely everything you're trying to do. You absolutely want to not go down that path. Yes, there's a vague promise that you're going to win the lottery, but how many people actually win the lottery? Close to none. The chances of being able to set yourself up to win the lottery are, are, are impossible. The only way to guarantee you win the lottery is to spend more money than you're going to win. And even then you could lose. You might be the one, you know, have the, missed the one ticket that was the winning ticket sort of thing. Even if you play every single number that's possible on the, the lotto thing, and you're guaranteed to win, you'll probably have spent more money than you're about to get back. So the everybody everywhere um, fantasy that your distro disk services sell you is a real, real damaging thing because in that time you've wasted time in which you could have been doing real groundwork, picking up a fan here and there and actually cementing that, especially if you're smart enough to be out there doing real events, booking yourself. You know, you're in a goth band, then you look around and you find other goth bands and you say, hey, when you're next doing a show and looking for people to put on the bill, guess a ring. And reminding them that you exist, getting, them, getting out there, showing them your video, having them go, okay, I can't get the normal support acts that I do when I put together my goth band show. I'll call that guy. I got Jake, well, Jake got himself into, Jake got himself into, to be fair, I may have set him up for this, hence my taking some ownership of this. Jake got quite a few gigs because of that, because he was around, they knew that he existed, and let me tell you, by the time that he'd finished his set, they were a bit surprised. It's by networking that he's picked up those gigs and putting himself in front of audiences who now start to go, ooh, there's that guy with the lovely hair. He's off with the Wiggles now, still, still completing the Canada tour as we speak. He went to see Iron Maiden in Canada, very exciting. He hopped on a video phone and here's me watching Iron Maiden from Canada. <laughs> I think that's about it. Now, I've broken a lot of the usual expectations here, but remember, once your song's finished, the if you build it, they will come is not a strategy and there is no action in that. While it's attractive because there is no action, there's no tactics, there's no activity that needs to be done or I do it and everything happens for me, yeah, no. Make sure you've got a great song with great performances and that your mix sets the scene and tells the story of that song and delivering you a stereo 1644 master. That's it, that's all you need. Be prepared. So as you know this song's coming up, so be doing this work when you're not in the studio. Uh, whilst your backline, like whilst me, the mix engineer, is mixing it for you, be getting your cover art prepared, your band avatars, posters, all that kind of stuff, the video and its thumbnail, and your copy. Get people better than you to read your copy. Because if your copy just says, oh, this is our first debut album, it's the very first time that we firstly released our debut first album, you've just made a deal of yourself, especially if you talk about... Oh, Benedict was born here and Benedict that. When you look at the top of the screen and it says, this is Benedict's channel. I'm clearly writing about myself, therefore I should write. I was born. I did this. That way I seem sane, at least. Uh, 
get your product if product is needed, but chances are if you're watching this, remember a digital product is probably all you need. Don't go pressing CDs, vinyl, anything like that until you've got a good number of people tugging on your t-shirt at shows saying, please sir, where is the CD? then you can probably consider investing hundreds or thousands of dollars and getting stuff pressed. Um, Jake told me that the landed cost for one of his CDs, so the Jake Cropley um, Falling Down in Love album, each one of those discs cost him $20 to land. Pressing, artwork, booklet, the whole lot. I mean, he, he went a little bit more in than I would have suggested, but it's a beautiful package. It's very nicely done, uh, but it cost him 15 bucks. So he has to put $20 on them to sell them. Uh, and that's hard. That really is hard. Don't go down that path unless you really, really need to. So where you put your song is, well, wherever your fans are. If your fans aren't there, don't go there. There's just no point. General, generic groups, especially other songwriter groups. Guess what? Other songwriters are not going to support you. I'm very rare in being a musical person who'll buy other people's records, but most musicians are there to just dump their stuff and ignore you or tread on you if they possibly can. Ignore those groups, go in there to talk to other songwriters, but don't go in there to promote yourself. Go to places where actual fans are. So if you're in a goth band, go into goth groups. If you're in a death metal band, go into death metal groups. If you're a Celine Dion type singer, then I don't quite know where you go, but you at least get in front of people who like Celine Dion. Maybe mother's groups, I don't know, I'm just guessing here. You've got to work that out, that's your job. Get your music on Bandcamp. Make your video, put it on YouTube. There's no combination that I know of that's more solid than that. Maybe if you're an EDM, Beatport may be okay. I think people can buy your stuff off Beatport. Um, but don't go to SoundClan and Spotify and all those kinds of places because all you're doing is just, well, pissing in the wind. It just will come straight back in your face. And it's embarrassing and you don't want to tell people, you'll, you'll just want to tell people how amazeballed you are because you felt your own pee splatter in your face. You don't want this. It's not going to build anything. Your own sight, if at all possible. Uh, and remember always the strategy of the four pillars of success. Who am I as an act? What am I selling? Who am I leading? Who, who am I tribe? Yeah. And Adam Ant had, has his ant people. Uh, quite a lot of them were fans of the Pistols as well, but Ant people. Uh, who's your backline? Adam Ant was nobody really until he had Malcolm McLaren and then really didn't happen, didn't come together until he got Marco Peroni, his guitarist. Backline, super important. Uh, your location. Well, for Ant, it was the Marquee and the Hundred Club along with all the other punk bands. And then he set himself up on television. You know, everybody was playing um, ant music. Stand and deliver. He had wonderful videos, over the top, ridiculous kinds of videos. But it led people to him. So that became his location. We turned on the telly to see Adam Ant. And then we went down the Dolce Vita to pick up the Adam Ant record. So we followed him to where he was, his location. And then remember to engage with people to build your fans one by one. Don't think that you can buy them or just drop your stuff everywhere and that, that its amazefulness will suddenly generate fans out of the ground like plants versus zombies. That's it. If you have any broad questions, pop them on down below. This is a big subject. So again, I would encourage you to watch this early, watch this often. And then when it comes time, work your way through it very carefully to make sure that you've got all your bases covered and that you are really giving yourself a good leg up because no one else is going to help you until you get to the point where you've got a, uh, a saleable product. And then people will start to hover around to see what they can do. And then you've got to pick out the ones that are worth going with versus those that just want to be bad scavengers. Whatever you do, work hard, have a great day.